Hello everyone, today we talk about the Egyptian or the Middle Kingdom's terrestrial and amphibious tactics. We will make other videos about uh, Egyptian naval warfare at the same time, more in depth, and then we will analyze um, other aspects of Egyptian warfare, such as the army organization and um, the individual troops' uh, equipment. Naturally, in a video dedicated to tactics, we will address this partially, but as you know, we have a pretty systematic approach, uh, topic-wise, to the various um, aspects, say, of every uh, every people's warfare in history in detail, so that's Schwerpunkt's goal overall. We talked about ancient Egyptian warfare, also the most uh, ancient one, uh, such as this, right, we are talking about one millennium of history. As you know, formally, uh, the old Middle Kingdoms are from the 27th to the uh, 17th century BC. We talked about the New Kingdom um, recently, but we still have a lot to, to make, even just as a premise. Uh, we talked about Egyptian siege warfare throughout all this, this time, fundamentally, up, even including the, the New Kingdom. Uh, and we have already observed there, there was more like a, a sources, um, kind of primary sources based video, m rather than anything, the, the difficulties naturally that we have in reconstructing certain specific um, aspects of uh, Egyptian warfare that age. So one millennium of history is also not approachable in a single video, uh, methodologically would require that kind of more in-depth uh, observation. There are actually lots of things that we know overall considering the times and places that, as you know most advanced civilizations uh, in the world uh, so it's it's one of those places where about about which we actually know something uh, decent um, in the first place um, and yet of course um, it's, it's still an enormous phase that uh, we we know importantly about from a political from a social point of view and so that could become also food for further military observations. So again, we may do that in the future at some point. F today we make um, a more concise story of what we think like tactics work like, and considering a bit of, a, a bit of context naturally, and some uh, proceeding by analogy and you know hypothesis and so on. So on better or worse than others, but trying to make a, a theory that uh, that fits. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about a, a very primitive time in the history of the military art, as you understand. For example, we're talking essentially about infantry armies, right? There is no cavalry around. Um, Charity uh, originally, you know, would be introduced in the, um, in the New Kingdom. Um, and so we are observing mostly at engagements that um, also in terms of collective training were still somewhat uh, pretty um, simple, right? The, the, the Egyptian military uh, organization, we'll see it now, fundamentally revolved around the various, uh, say properly the kings, the pharaohs, the retinues, the ones of other lords that had a uh, better equipment, of course, uh, than the average, but fundamentally we don't see much armor around at this point. And um, sort of militia, um, some of which was levied properly from towns that had this attractive capacity um, from, from the countryside. You know, Egypt had um, this dramatic surplus thanks to the fertility provided by the, the Nile that, as we'll see now, also conferred, as you know, in informed the, the entire Egyptian civilization from a political, but also from a strategic point of view. Um, and um, let's say a general conscription that for, for which every peasant fundamentally that had already received some training in their late teens would be like for the rest of their lives or their able life uh, to people didn't live excessively long, as you understand, but still 
uh, could provide, in fact, a military service in case of the larger expeditions. Most of warfare consisted in raids, fundamentally, but of course there was an important degree of siege warfare, military engineering, naval forces. Um, given that the, the, the wealth of the country was concentrated on the land immediately adjacent to the, to the river banks. Um, and so uh, you understand that basically throughout the river you could reach quite easily um, and move properly a large amount of, of, of masses towards the main uh, strongholds that were also located uh, along the Nile. The Nile has this interesting um, characteristic in, in the area climatologically for which the wind normally blows upstream. So basically you can uh, travel uh, with the you know technology of the time quite speedily, right? Both upstream and, and downstream, right? Using um, the wind and and uh, and the current just um, at, at that point. And uh, we have also later accounts about this. For example, Herodotus visited Egypt much later, and this time it took only four days to travel from Thebes to Elephantine, um, which is a bit more than 220 kilometers, which means in the mid 5th century BC, um, being able to travel at approximately 55 kilometers per day. Armies march fundamentally at 30 kilometers per day, pretty universally all over history, right? Uh, except in cases of very bad terrain, but that, that is the exception, not the norm. And armies, generally speaking, cross the best terrains. In fact, most of uh, the pitched battles, as always, already at the time, were, um, you know, set in pretty flat lands that could serve the purpose. Um, naturally, resources were limited. We we're talking about, as we were saying before, extremely archaic times, millennia before Christ. Uh, and therefore, uh, what would we see also, as we were noticing before regarding the equipment, etc., um, we'll see also in b better now. There wasn't an enormous amount of resources in, in absolute terms, but relatively to those systems, it was still a big deal, right? Um, and uh, warfare was not that um, dramatically intense compared to, to later times, but it still did present the possibility, the, the likelihood of, you know, of getting to major battles with hundreds, thousands of, uh, of men at some point in your uh, in your lifetime. We don't know too much about the whole thing. There are, again, in this millennium, some phases like the one of the intermediate period that also indicates some kind of broader civilizational instability, contraction at the point. So there is an alternating phase of those you know, powers that could exercise a significant control over large parts of the Nile Valley, but others in which instead everything got more fragmented and individual lords engaged in this kind of also uh, frontier warfare, um, you know, uh, raids, etc. in a kind of more uh, encapsulated uh, reality, kind of feudal reality almost. Uh, and naturally the whole system was somewhat just a blend of this all. It was just changing by scale. There were engagements um, against uh, neighbors, against other peoples, and also invaders at a point towards the la later period, especially as you know. But Egypt was very much kind of a civilization on, on its own. You know that even though, uh, of course, uh, popula say cultures uh, were in communication across all the continents at the time, there was no such thing as, you know, discoveries or anything. Like people crossed even the, the, the Pacific Ocean. At the time, the um, the point being though is that um, in, in relative terms, uh, Egypt compared, for example, to the Mesopotamic civilizations, evolved um, in parallel, uh, so suggesting the contact, etc., but with, with very specific uh, original features that therefore make us understand that there was kind of properly an internal development. Right, uh, Mesopotamia actually predates Egypt by uh, a few. Um, um, time in, in the emerging of what we call that historical civilization, but the moment in which Egypt immediately catches up, it, it's already a form uh, system in its own, so and this was due in part to its own, again, internal wealth but also relative isolation 
the Nile itself is a dramatic uh, obstacle for anyone invading, especially from, from the east, where most in fact, the other civilized peoples came from. Um, and the, the, the wealth is concentrated across this tiny fertile line surrounded by the desert and that therefore is, is able to maintain itself as this bulwark, as this entire uh, fortress. Naturally there were waves of people who were mercenaries um, and there is a great debate uh, also at a point in Egyptian history what was the relation for example with Nubia with Wu ruled over Bum. These are things that we will um, look at um, in other moments. It's not even that important because frankly Egypt remained always the center of that civilization, so even when you find some kind of foreign dynasties or things like these, they are, yes, they're foreign, but they're actually, you know, ruling over countries still of Egyptians, um, and um, that's where, in fact, the most of the, even properly, the, the, the manpower is concentrated. The manpower that is also a bit weighted during a good season when the, the Nile overflows and, and, in fact, fertilizes for the, its banks, uh, where the farmers stop working because everything is flooded, and that's the moment when this massive demographic potential can be actually put at war. And also through that aforementioned amphibious operations, because again, everything is turning into a swamp, um, and therefore you have a lot actually of naval warfare going on, especially for um, movement, but also for actual naval engagements. So there would be really a lot to tell today, especially setting from, from the army organization. Today we talk about tactics only instead. So as we were saying before, Egyptian forces in this period were exclusively infantry, right? Tactics were based on the use of massed formations of close order archers and hand-to-hand -hand fighters that were called respectively uh, Megao, that is properly the shooters, and na um, Ktuha, that is strong of R, right? Perhaps split equally from a numerical point of view. Uh, we know that uh, both uh, troops formed up in lines, several ranks uh, deep. Um, the archers uh, shot also from kneeling positions while those behind stood, and this is especially true at closer range where the um, the trajectory, the, the arrow trajectory could be more um, more straight, and so hitting also closer range with greater effect. We will see now how infantry and, say, melee and, and missile troops interacted with one another, and this was pretty much it, right? These were the two main arms, there wasn't cavalry around, um, and the, the, the equipment uh, was also pretty basic, right? The troops armed for hand-to-hand -hand combat were meant naturally to engage at close range with a bullhide shield. Sometimes this bullhide pattern is, is also properly painted, um, and this um, and uh, there were different varieties and different uh, designs probably that could correspond to some uh, identification systems that also we're not completely able to reconstruct, but as always. Um, and these shields were pretty large, they could in fact be one meter and, and a half in height, and they had already assumed by this time essentially um, uh, the, the characteristic Egyptian shield form throughout most of the, fact of the period that you see has basically a, a rectangular base and then a round top, right, and uh, being also fairly large, right, with, um, with straight sides. So the function of these shields, given the prominence, as we will see now, of missile warfare as well, was naturally uh, serving this purpose of, uh, like, a bit of a what would become at least stereotypically, because it's not even entirely like that, the, the pavis in late medieval times, uh, they could be fixed properly on the ground because the shield is also heavy, so you can't just uh, keep it in your hands. Like consider that um, a, a smaller one, like like the scutum, for example, in later times was eight kilos. And I don't know if you ever tried to, to maintain up a, 
eight kilos luggage for a prolonged amount of time. So obviously this thing was fixed on the ground. Um, it uh, gave like if you look at the uh, at the t uh, curved top, like it looks exactly like the crenellated battlements in the same Egyptian fortifications, and naturally this allowed enough protection, especially just in front of the head, like following the curved um, shape, but also some lateral capacity for, for literally looking through. And the point of this um, straight shield on the sides was the possibility, and, and, and flat ones, which was not, were not curved, if not by, by a few degrees, depends also on the type of warrior normally. Um, the the more individualistic the, the the fighting and the more curved the shield really is, um, where you can have thickly compact formation, but with some kind of higher degree of individualistic fighting. For example, Roman legionnaires were something like that. Even though um, there is this bit this misunderstanding for which people think that they were just you know functional information, but they were actually fighting as single, um, uh, in fact. Uh, combat troops like in, in, a, in a deeply conceptual way. In any case, this, this type of shields allowed to overlap, right, being mostly flat and covering enough so to form, a, in fact, a shield wall for, as it always basically a shield wall is, mostly against, um, against missile, right? Of course, also against blows, we will see that the degree of penetrativity of, of weapons, including also the, the melee ones at this point, was not such uh, for rendering necessary even helmets or armor. So the shield was enough, right? And um, therefore, as it mostly happens in battles that could last hours, right, uh, most of the time was spent just throwing stuff at each other, right? Uh, there were javelins, there were stones, but mostly arrows. Um, and this um, infantry, this melee infantry, had naturally a primary role because it was the heavy one, right? Um, and uh, the shield was ide ideally suited to allow such close order troops to form a continuous vo wall of shields. And so also the shock infantry, uh, because these formations would also open. We, we, we are aware of the type of training that these troops underwent, and much of this is also depicted quite graphically, it has to do with uh, practice, also like wrestling, etc. Because the idea is that still these uh, formations are not um, particularly uh, solid, right? The units are not, not too cohesive. Um, there is still a, a, a strongly um, and primitively individualistic idea. Uh, there is indeed a, a type of heroic um, warfare involved even though Egypt has this dramatic amount of demographic resources so the lesser people constitute a very significant strategic and tactical uh, force still the idea of course is that this this um, kingdom is ruled by uh, a divine race uh, and that uh, all the power fundamentally emanates from them the retinues are the top troops and they're fiercely uh, trained right in, in a type of uh, of combat that in fact is um, pretty much um, personal right it, it's um, again as we'll see now collective uh, training and tactics of course as in all the history of mankind are, are there right there is heroic warfare in the sense of just two guys dueling um, just settling matters never truly existed, there was always a support of, of, of some. But at the same time, uh, it's, um, it's true that the, the, it's the retinues of, 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 the, of the pharaoh, the nobility, to make up the, the best of this infantry and to have also an important assault shock capacity. This is true also for in, si in siege warfare, given that, as we were saying, also military engineering is, is importantly developed. Um, and thus, as always in history, it's actually the elite troops that storm the uh, the fortifications, not the uh, the lighter ones, right? Um, because they would be taken out that simply. And so there is a lot of interaction, surely, um, uh, b between the the various arms. If we can talk about this in plural for fundamentally just infantry, but still, you know, 
the division between Malay and missile is very significant. You can do a lot of interesting things, um, making them cooperating. Um, and uh, it's that bloody because you have to come that close to the enemy to make a significant damage, right? Even the the bows are powerful, but they have a limited uh, potential overall. Uh, light infantry alone does not win. You need heavy infantry, and that's the reason why they're called uh, that different, and because they are in relative terms. Consider that the uh, the most the, the primary weapon, like the most important one, were copper axes, also pretty pretty sizable ones uh, that were, of course, aside from the anti-human function, also designed probably with some effectiveness against the same shields that were, as we were saying now, basically working as, as armor, right, as the only type of, um, of specifically designed d defense system. Uh, and um, they mm, they were sighted also by spears, but the majority of them were of, of these were designed with a flat or voluted tank, with round or leaf shaped, displaying blades, um, and uh, the the latter time ensured that a serious stabbing wound could be inflicted, but most importantly that the spear could be recovered quickly, ready for further use, and even if you penetrate someone just a little bit with these weapons. It's, don't think it's that easy to to take uh, the, the spear out in, in safety because, you know, killing a human being is, is much more complicated than than it seems, uh, especially in these contexts where you don't have dramatically shocking weapons and you can even trespass somebody for, you know, tens of times and this guy's still, you know, being on, on his feet and, you know, understanding that he's, he's a goner, like, just, you know, he's trying to take you back with him in the process and especially if you remain with with a with a spear stuck in somebody's body and you know you can't let it go this guy can simply climb the spear uh and and in reaching you so um the mm, th there wasn't objectively any uh, the reason why th the spears had such a limited role after all compared to the axes and and the same and the same bow probably in, at least in a broader quantity in, in battle uh, uh, quantity of power really uh, is the fact that uh, there wasn't enough um, collective training for having functionalized um, spearman formations that could hold the ground to to the point of you know in, in large enough numbers not to risk being out, outflanked or anything. So um, the entire armament had been developing. Uh, around this kind of much more versatile and fundamentally offensive type of warfare, right? Where you could, yes, also uh, wait for, for the enemy to, to attack, to hopefully making him losing cohesion, but normally advances, especially also in the lack of cavalry and just having missile as, as a threat that is not, at, especially at, at, at that distance when you approach greater than, than, uh, than, than, a, than an enemy counterattack. We're still, in fact, basing this kind of dramatic infantry charges in, in the last meters that were meant properly to physically smash, but, you know, in, among infantrymen, right? And that's where also the axe was uh, so important um, for, because uh, it was really all based on this kind of short but extremely brutal engagements in which people chopped themselves to pieces quite, quite beautifully. And they fundamentally were all based on that kind of gamble that didn't require much other tactical sophistication except of course the combination between the various arms especially as um, as uh, larger the, uh, the the broader forces really were naturally as most warfare there was plenty of things like raiding the um, it's important to to understand also the, the Egyptian strategy of the time was, as we were saying before, aimed mostly at controlling the um, uh, Nile uh, cities slash fortresses. There were some kind of more peripheral frontier-like um, realities, like south in the in the cataracts. At this point, I think they arrived up to the. The, uh, the southern outskirts of, of the second one. It was a trading frontier, but naturally warfare occurred. Um, as you understand, outside of the main, like, uh, of, of the uh, proximities 
of, of the Nile. Also, everything took like the form of some kind of um, dusty, semi-arid paths that could be um, could could also support like only a you know a limited number of troops, at least if not stretch and very long um, columns that were more easily prey of enemy attacks, and so there especially archery played even a greater role. Needless to say, at this point, uh, there were foreign soldiers in Egyptian service as auxiliaries. Um, there, were pro there, there were properly forms of mercenarism uh, within the same Egypt, of course, uh, two important levels of professionalism. We, we see it in, um, in various tomes of lords slash mercenaries, I mean, people that uh, in different times were either, you know, at the pharaoh's service or kind of, you know, were independent, de, de facto independent lords on their own. And they were about that kind of warfare and control. Uh, the era was rich, and so also in, um, for example, just think about the, the magnificent uh, Egyptian architecture, those times, etc. There was a lot of uh, labor force that had to be properly co-opted and escorted and uh, watched over. So much of these soldiers at some point were also um, administrators, people that had to control others. As you know, there was a case system were uh, properly even the single tactical specialties like if you were the son of an archer you, you, you were to remain in a sense um, an archer yourself and so your children and so on so there, there was this uh, millinery universal absolute kind of order that where everything fit in this also incredibly brutal uh, system at the same time where however individuals were in fact much more directly in contact with um, uh, with these mechanisms and had to watch over themselves personally over um, over the same uh, routes over the same trades and everything was so directly um, uh, violent as it's witnessed by those same uh, same toms were this ban again in a, in a world that uh, in, in absolute terms wouldn't seem to us so 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 violent because again the, the the primitive military potential was limited, but if for 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 an individual point of view, we were really important, were really involving, were really uh, costly too, and so were also worth being remembered for the afterlife. That of course was the most important um, dimension for for everyone, and naturally with the deeply ingrained universal traditional idea that. Uh, you know, uh, what you do in life determines eventually what you will be in, in the afterlife, except Egyptian civilization was different in many ways from ours because it still kind of, um, you know, had a, a much closer um, presence of, of the dead in, in life, right, in, in quite uh, direct ways that already in other civilizations, even, you know, the same Jewish one, for example, later on, that also had to do with Egypt, as, as you know, during the the captivity, the Egyptian one at least, uh, were, you know, separating the, the, the two aspects more, etc. But that's just also a broader pros product of modernization and secularization. Um, in any case, in, in frontier contexts, um, auxiliaries, as always, are to be found because they are just more exotic native troops that you can afford. There were lots of Bedouins that especially on, on the eastern frontier of Egypt who uh, you know were very useful for example in scouting skirmishing ambushing you know that they had uh, an even more wilder more savage and primitive lifestyle that was really one with with, with the with with the land with the dirt even. Um, and that uh, that had all the properly adapted um, weaponry for for those kind of circumstances these troops naturally figured also in the greater Egyptian engagements where, as we'll see now, we're probably stationed on some kind of um, uh, lateral position, like not at the center, because the, the infantry we described, as light as it sounds, literally was the heaviest existing at the time, right? So single, uh, say, differences, even in a slightly different type of weaponry or even the availability of a side one, etc., could really make that difference between heavy and 
and light, right? Egyptians did not lack manpower, definitely in their own land, but still most of the people were kind of uh, more kind of, uh, if not properly gentrified, but let's say de de demilitarized, right? They were a bit more civilized, and so they had lost that kind of aptitude to radical violence daily uh, enactment, even though, of course, anything violently traumatic is, um, you know, it's not repeated so often over time, right? The the experience of battle during the, the Old and Middle Kingdom was something terrifying, like, it, uh, you know, that there is just a certain given amount of combat days that somebody can be under in terms of, uh, you know, literally of tolerance, uh, after which basically you're not just going to be a functional individual anymore. I think contemporarily speaking, it's just 40 days. After 40 days of combat, you're put out of, 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 of the battlefield. You, you become an instructor or something. Because more than that, we figure out during World War II actually makes you underperforming. doesn't matter how much of a veteran um, you really are. So, um, again, as we were saying, people did not, did not live really much of a time. But let's say that there was um, uh, a chance for the especially for the men of the retinues to get engaged in pitch battles several times in their lives. Um, and it were, you know, quite, quite uh, traumatic experiences in their own regard, but there was also plenty of other type of engagements that could really be uh, remarkable for those who took part in it, even though we, uh, we don't know practically anything of uh, individually. Um, the the problem of reconstructing uh, this old and middle kingdom tactics is that um, we have very little surviving um, from the reliefs and inscriptions regarding to the way of battle, let's say, compared to the new kingdom, of course, about which we have really... Uh, a lot more in, in that video about ancient Egyptian siege warfare this this period. I was evidencing that so it can be useful even just to, to add a bit to, to this video if you haven't watched that one yet. Um, so we mostly rely actually on New Kingdom evidence to more or less understand what was going on. In fact we don't really think that much really changed tactically wise um, throughout this millennia in the at least in the in the essentials in the interaction of the various arms before the introduction of of chariotry of cavalry uh, the latter in a functional sense much uh, later um, one problem is not that the old and middle kingdoms sources are uh, you know not representing this they did but unfortunately, royal monuments such as the pyramid temples and causeways were decorated uh, with such reliefs, yet they were largely destroyed by later kings and uh, the blocks were reused. Um, so, as we were saying before, private tombs uh, and inscriptions can provide actually more detail, but still tend to reflect minor local activities because these are somewhat lesser sources of, again, lesser people who, first of all, were less likely to document meaningful accomplishments as opposed to, say, the ones of single pharaohs. So you know that there are some parts of the various dynasties that are also properly not recorded. We know at some point there were several kings in a row. We don't even know their names or nicknames. Um, and so just we have to go with that, not knowing practically uh, much. Um, the New Kingdom, yes, had cavalry already, so the problem is, um, or charity, or should charity mostly if you prefer, uh, that uh, the tactics uh, had been, you know, had suited to that uh, and so modified partially also the infantry uh, employment. But it still seems, again, that the changes were relatively minor. And so we can't reconstruct ideally what, what a battle 
could could be like at the time. So, um, naturally, in warfare we've seen it very often. Every battle is different, so there is not a, a theoretical model that fits everyone, right? We think about oplitic tactics in in classical uh, Greece. Um, can you? Name to me a single Hellenic battle that was actually the theoretical model of a politic battle. There is no, right? Because they all differed for for sound reasons. Some something, some factor, some element that went astray from that. The same is valid for for any other um, context, armies, uh, tactics. The art of war really always change uh, constantly, and that's properly the point of history. There's no no stasis. It's just in simpler um, communities, uh, you have a greater continuity, and in this case, at least our ignorance can be compensated with a more predictable uh, outline. So, there, there are also some universal general principles in tactics, and if you look at an old Middle Kingdom uh, army, you, you would have seen essentially this core principle. Essentially, there, there is a a battle line, uh, the main one, or at least uh, the one that is provided with a center and wings. Then there can be uh, a vanguard and a rear guard, uh, but the bulk naturally stands in, in the center. In the center is uh, located also the commander. Um, the the vanguard would have been. Uh, destined to those elements as always that want to break really that perhaps are properly the, the most fanatic um, chargers and breakers that want to show off the the, the, you, the you know the aristocratic youth that is um, spiritually exalted and ultra loaded and that will make perhaps an important breakthrough in the enemy lines that disordering uh, disordering them enough and allowing the, the main body to, to capitalize on that. Uh, this is a rear guard that is also composed sometimes but by fine troops because uh, the main commander would be in the front, as you understand, but very often the second would, would maintain the, um, the the rear guard and that function is also to, in fact, to stamp right those that wanna wanna try to escape. The thing is made easier by the fact that there is no much of cavalry around so it would have been more difficult in fact for you know to prevent a cavalry or a chariot r retreat with, with infantry it would have you know it would have caused the domino effect that would be very difficultly stammable the same thing could happen with large masses uh, of people also f fleeing you know on foot from from the center but generally speaking quality there is in fact what you really need and so you always have in the rear somebody checking and avoiding and pressing and uh, say for, for the for the uh, formation to remain intact right D wings are um, composed by lighter troops um, there is a debate where actually the divide between melee troops and archers would uh, would lay in this kind of tactical uh, repetition, this this formation. Um, people say in the wings there were javeliners, so other, other types of skir skirmishers, also foreign auxiliaries in some sort. This is this is correct. Uh, I agree with that because um, the the elite, right, the, the punching element, uh, also the one capable of standing uh, its ground more firmly if if the initiative is led to the enemy is in the center right and uh, the idea I may be uh, maybe biased by my 14th century studies but is that of course most of the missile potential would be deployed on, on the sides right and and the reason being that if you have lighter troops that can perform this kind of what first of all as you understand the, the the most expansive troops are in the center so these are really the heavy infantry the wings are composed likely also of heavy infantry of sort but of lighter type and probably of more missile troops it may be actually that the archers were properly um, deployed there and massed there people say well there could be a screen of archers in the front yes too there could be other 
archers or other missile troops running uh, like in, in open formation back and forth uh, amidst the you know more thickly packed uh, melee infantry uh, units absolutely but at some point these troops had to be concentrated er somewhere right so if you want to have a snipers or say a close range that really want to hit hard maximizing the effect of their weapons at you know supporting infantry in close in close combat uh, you can have some sort of that the same retinues that made up as we've seen the cream of the uh, of the infantry would be provided with their own their own missile troops um, so they could be the, 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 the missile could be interspersed in part like that but at the same time in especially larger engagements you need greater um, volume of fire especially being delivered at a certain rhythm order that is the best way to disrupt at parity of uh, arrows shot the the enemy formation as you know you can have the same amount of of, um, of projectiles shot over the same amount of time but let's say if these are concentrated within the same amount of time in a smaller one you, you're going to have a greater effect on the enemy formation primarily from a psychological point of view but also from from a um, from a material point of view, especially as far as the order of the formation is really concerned. Um, and so this would be likely uh, performed also by troops that, um, like, it, it does take some collective training, but, you know, also the ones stationed on the wings could perform that um, more easily. Uh, the concept of this interspersed infantry supporting the enemy at closer range is something you find um, even in Assyri Assyrian warfare that we have seen, um, mostly for the, the Neo-Assyrian um, phase, etc. But uh, that does make a lot of sense, and we know how important Archer really was, and how armored also har Archers really were. So here we don't have that, because it's much it's much earlier time, so you don't have armor even for the heaviest troops. Um, but, uh, of course, the power of the bows and, you know, the skills of, 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 the, of the archers were, as we were saying before, in, in, in the same retinues also selected, say, the, the middle retinues had also the best archers, the ones more capable of, you know, coming closer to the enemy, but also knowing how to, to pull out safely. Um, whereas what you would find on the wings, rather, was, you know, the, the levy troops or something that were just there to, to shoot and to run as soon as, you know, any melee um, infantrymen approach um, and obviously the first type was much more designed to properly strike at close range and being a better sharpshooter than than the latter but still the most important thing of course was carried out by by the wing men altogether rather than by the single shooters that maybe had more that kind of again individual they wanted to sh shoot down that specific guy the specific lord that's you know um, so it, it's a different concept from the one of volume of fire, let's say, volume of shot, um, this context. And so that's my interpretation, because it's, I, I can't think of much other ways to, to think an inter a functional interspersion of archery and, and melee infantry in such a, you know, universally outlined kind of, you know, center, wings, vanguard, rearguard, right? Um, and it, it's obviously enough, as we were saying before, uh, collective training was not dramatically advanced, so these formations would eventually uh, decay uh, and uh, disorder. But uh, and so you would have easily seen like a total mess where there were just archers running around and infantrymen smashing each other's heads um, and all these kind of things. But uh, the the order was ideally preserved and we don't have to think that uh, it was so you know um utopistic to achieve especially for the larger more more powerful armies and again we're talking about 1000 years of history so um lots of things happened within them that just we don't know and surely there were significant military developments at some point we can observe also the Again, what, what the real evidence is, because um, I am just, as we were saying before, 
making a normalized analysis of what kind of like a battle could kind of look like but when you get in the sources and you realize where we get all the, this information very often um, we know also of copies of other models of we, we don't really have to think that what is, what is depicted is exactly telling us something so clear about especially the physical dynamic um, except of course the art is beautiful and many things can be indeed understood in detail by the extraordinary finds that also you can see here even especially in the funerary uh, retinues you see all these men uh, you know orderly are right and uh, you know with this kind of ideal standardization was easier to achieve because of course they were equipped with very very primitively still but but anyhow still effectively in fact for that kind of, of warfare w was pretty much homogeneous um, throughout most of this time um, naturally uh, the role of archers is crucial because um, it is meant to on the wings to basically destroy the enemy wings and so capitalize upon this by following on the enemy flank while he's engaging combat and that normally would bring to the uh, disruption of the formation and the lighter troops would be also the ones more capable of running uh, after the uh, the heavier ones again it may seem strange to us how the, you know, there would there be an edge between, uh, you know, a guy equipped with, you know, with, with an axe as opposed to one with a bow. But it's the tactical role that they have that would have also exhausted more the melee infantry to the point that would have been much more easily captured. And uh, again, it's not a physical thing; it's about mental collapse, which is also a physical one, by the way. Some people would be just, you know, shocked by the by the defeat because you know if they were believed to be uh, a superior race of gods and they were just destroyed of course this meant that they weren't and so that they were to be um, gone forever devoured by the the, the most uh, dramatically uh, you know tonic elements that had nothing to do with the divine transfiguration um, and that sense of death as you know in in Egyptian civilization is always quite incumbent the idea of the judgment as well and so on so this tells you also how loaded in themselves the elite that represented that hierarchical system of the universe really were right and never forget the psychological aspect it's the single most important um, for sure naturally um, uh, uh, tactical engagements could vary like in different with different formations arrays and, and so on um, there was an intrinsic advantage as always in 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 defense if, you know uh, the 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 party that was uh, coming to battle and had the most stra pressing strategic need to, to give battle would um, march for a longer time deployed in formation as they could and along the way they could disrupt themselves more um, enemy fire came to be more disruptive naturally a closer range where that kind of more straight uh, trajectory of, uh, of arrows could be more deadly and that's where you see more likely the the guys kneeling because if you have otherwise to to carry out a, a much more uh, acutely parabolic fire just shoot um, you know even in the air that making the arrow falling on the earth or uh, hitting some guy in in the in, you know in in the mass there and that's where the volley were designed most for, for doing not not precision fire for sure um, and um, troops could be of course uh, deployed internally in different ways that the best elements would be in the front necessarily um, the others would support um, we see again very uh, you know close formations of uh, spearmen hand-to-hand -hand fighters in rectangular columns or deep lines supported by close order archers in line as well which would make us suggest again that it is possible that archers were also interspersed in a more kind of linear fashion uh, in depth like in properly actually in column in this sense uh, between the uh, the units of melee troops 
right? It, it's just, uh, it, it is possible that there would be some tactical inveniences in which this could, could really happen. Um, it, uh, in, for example, if this had this corresponded to maintaining formation in column, as you know, is more functional for movement, for advancing, and um, it's, um, it, it makes things going speedier, but then you have to deploy in, in, deploy in line most of the time. So um, there could be situations in which you wanted, for example, to afford um, enough, uh, an, an orderly enough archery uh, fire uh, in uh, situations uh, in which having made archers arriving just in s scatter kind of in line would have been would have brought to disorder them more than they would in, in columns pressed among other infantry units so just guessing but of course there is not just the the classical flat uh, ground pitch battle where the, the perfect deployment would be would be in fact uh, employable in the first place and combined arms tactics on the battlefield are pretty much obvious like the same middle kingdom fortresses of Nubia display a sound understanding of the principles of crossfire and enfilade so we can expect these principles to have been put into effect in open battle also except um, naturally fortresses are a bit of a different thing um, they are essentially a sound uh, obstacle that can give the same form of the enemy deployment whereas the attackers have to put themselves in that condition of inferiority to, to attack these forces and so overwhelming them mostly numbers as we've seen in the video about siege warfare in, in open field it's a bit of a different thing because you have essentially forces that more or less are of a comparable size so you cannot quite carry out um, uh, crossing or enfilade fire if you don't catch the enemy between two fires which in open field the formations are exactly created not to allow right so that's why we see the center with the wings and the aforementioned capacity of the wings to break one of, of, of the enemy ones in, in the front and essentially pouring on the enemy flank and so there you have the thing but at that point the enemy would likely um, you know also be significantly uh, disadvantage to to bring to, to the same breaking of its own formation so um, but the concept there being somewhat uh, the same right and it's obvious that if you are advancing for example as a numerically superior enemy and as we've seen here the quality from a moral point of view could vary dramatically but you know you, you would expect to enter essentially in a in a in a corner of death right the one between the the two wings shooting and even some element from the center so unless you had enough troops to suppress you know to counter that fire in the first place and so uh, distributing it all over the line and so uh, are, are reaching some sort of symmetry it would have been difficult for you to to, to not to, to be significantly exposed to that fire maybe you would have broken the en the, the enemy you would have broken the enemy formation anyway because you were stronger maybe melee infantry just from a moral point of view etc and considered that you know forces could be quite sizable but uh, smaller engagements are more normal and these armies are not some of the largest definitely in military history um, for the obvious limits of the the political and social structure so um, it was also more likely to um, to see uh, kind of greater odds defied um, and again also consider that the equipment is pretty much much more standard so really what really counts that much is your mind right uh, in part also your body in, in a way but still you know nothing compared to moral forces and especially in when these are in, in large numbers and that's really what what matters um so speaking of amphibious operations as we were saying before these were pretty common during the good season at some point um because the nile would um uh, would uh, be swollen and the the landscape would turn in, into a, a swamp and so any kind of you know a, a vessel you can imagine from smaller 
we've seen in a Syrian war for even just letter, um, you know, containers filled in air, and other kind of things could could do for crossing, um, for crossing some some water, but um, the Egyptian naval engineering was quite quite advanced. We will see that in a dedicated uh, video from our recently started naval uh, engineering series. Um, and even though we can think that some tales, such as the one told by the papyrus of Saint Petersburg, um, eleven fifteen point twenty eight, dating to the 12th dynasty, right, uh, known as the tale of the shipwrecked sailor, speaks of, um, speaking of 120 sailors as as an exaggeration, we have to consider that uh, at, at this point the difference between the uh, rowers, the sailors, and the the warriors was less than in kind of more in, in later naval warfare, where the roles were much more distinguished, right, between the orders and the marines. Uh, so everything was much more dynamic. You have to imagine this Egyptian population crawling literally everywhere, um, uh, and uh, infesting in this kind of warfare that, again, was also objectively quite violent, even at um, uh, uh, relatively demilitarized levels. We have evidence of um, from model soldiers from the early 11th dynasty tomb of Meseti, most of the ones that I have inserted here, you know, the, the soldiers' pictures, um, and also the ones of the of the of the both models, uh, comprising in fact a body of spearmen and 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 one of archers, both organized in in two blocks of 40 men, arrayed ten ranks deep. This may represent a basic unit of organization, both uh, on uh, like on land and on board, and uh, it, there is also not much of a difference. Like we, like in that video, I made for example about the Militas Classiari, the the Roman Marines. Uh, there was a follower said, "Oh my God, I, I didn't know that there was uh, basically no difference between uh, the you know the the, the Marines and uh, you know land land troops." Like, well, yeah, because they were technically the same thing. So also here we can of course see in, in a way a, a minimal distinction between some kind of marines that are still kind of broader you know soldiers in amphibious operations and other kind of sailors we we can we can say and naturally this was the civilization like in places like Nubia you know the arrival of uh, their, their denial is a bit more difficult but still navigable and uh, you know especially in order to, to perform such military operations. So you can imagine there is like, you know, a, a massive feat of technology being deployed as a reflection of the broader Egyptian um, uh, power. And uh, the, the pharaohs were engaged in this kind of uh, big raiding parties, this big chevauché, except the word no cheval. Um, and uh, warfare was about this raiding and so also think about the, the logistical needs to load the loot but also simply to, to maintain the soldiers also in areas that were kind of more hostile so you couldn't really uh, rely too much on the local resources but as we were saying before it was very easy to um, ship a significant amount of men and material uh, along the Nile back and forth without significant difficulties um, Naturally, if winds do not assist you and you're going upstream, well, that can be a problem, right? So there was m much probably a strategic game associated to, to, this kind, to that kind of gamble. And surely there were many disasters that occurred both logistically and strategically in the process. Also considering that um, differently from later warfare, it seems that most of the contingents were literally just shipped. That is to say, they were the... the the, the, the naval forces were not employed just to support the land army, that this could happen, but literally entire armies were carried on water, right? And you know that in later warfare, basically, 
you know, naval warfare is also not so relevant in ancient and medieval times because the, the ships were just essentially to to support the the land armies. They were normally not maintained for a longer time, and so the most important naval engagements are um, rare and also connected with some kind of very advanced kind of novel um, civilizations, cultures, etc. Um, at this point, instead, you have to imagine, as always, even in here, kind of the bigger ships and lots of other ships, boats that um, came along, and so. Uh, this was also a safety measure because in, in in spite of the important Egyptian bureaucracy and the state was being built, um, uh, we have to think that most of these operations were all, okay, let's, let's involve uh, everything we have of a certain given territory and let's simply make them ship back and forth. And, and it was relatively easy. Again, labor uh, and, and, and force and manpower were very quickly available. Uh, to especially to the pharaohs, uh, but also to other uh, landlords, and so um, things could work and would work so habitually like that. Because again, the Nile was everything. It was basically not another theater of operation. That there were expeditions, delegations to other peoples around, but fundamentally, it was only the Nile, right? Um, and naturally, things get complex. Because the delta is different from the other areas from the, the center, the, the, the cataracts, and so on. But at the end of the day, we're looking at still at that uh, environment, which offered that degree of mobility. And of course, you realize that uh, also the demographic and thus also military force of Egypt was concentrated in the north, in the center. Um, so there were important centers also in the south, of course, but I mean, this diluted eventually, and so also the capacity of waging war south were more complicated uh, because still, even if you had all that force in, in the north, let's say, bringing them south was also requiring an effort that not necessarily the coercive powers of, of the kingdom could sustain for much of a prolonged time. And so, in fact, there were clashes and so on. Um, the uh, the uh, you know the the fortresses on the Nile banks were importantly connected with uh, quays with uh, some infrastructures very often covered um, and uh, also built in stone at, at the point so to facilitate the supplies received from from the river and the the paths that led to the fortresses of course those were vital because again you have to be connected to the river and maintaining the connection there not to be severed out of of, of that because if you if, if so happens you're you know you're in trouble especially in areas where you don't have too much interland to to cultivate which you know of course in air in, in some areas it's also pretty large so um, you could still reach the Nile by sheer force at that point, but um, in 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 broader political and strategic sense, the the, the point mostly was launching uh, with a a, a Nile-based military force, uh, the Middle Kingdom, let's say, um, expeditions, disembarking your your troops, surprising. Um, the Nubians with sudden attacks to their settlements, um, looting chattel, um, and importantly enough, exterminating everybody because you know that that's how you you ensure that at least for a generation or so, um, if there is any children left, you at least you know these people are not going to become warriors, but you disrupt the basically the the, the possibility of further per prosper development. And again, this was a a remarkably miserable world. So of few you live and of nothing you die. So this is really uh, a relatable concept in a different scale at any time in history. Um, but sometimes it was enough. 
uh, as always, again, it's a problem of the center and the per uh, of the periphery and how much the center is willing to engage from its kind of privileged position in the periphery and for which reasons. And very often, you know, um, the periphery can at some point point cause problems because, you know, the center doesn't want to use iron fist too much on it. And um, uh, what else to say about these um, the, say amphibious operations? It's obvious that also in in the core of Egypt, the main cities were deriving their their power from from the Nile. Such so it was very important to control there the supply lines uh, in order to say to besiege a large center. Um, and so all this entailed a series of amphibious operations that were significantly intertwined also with the, with the sieges because there were cities that were literally open on the Nile. So um, you could literally enter them through the same river. Um, and there were assaults of this kind also by surprise very often. So consider that in spite of the remarkable Egyptian engineering, naturally not every center was properly uh, enclosed in at least in an impenetrable fashion so this kind of amphibious uh, assault troops um, you, that you couldn't imagine uh, being very very common especially among the elite and the professionals um, were a significant uh, resource for, for any army and uh, there was also some counter incursion specialized troops uh, in the same ways. Sometimes though it's also a matter of sheer mass and so much so in a, in a such a large and after all complex country like Egypt. As we were saying before um, Egypt experienced the annual inundation when large areas of the valley were s submerged and shallow draft vessels would be invaluable for communication and in that moment as work in the fields ceased this was also a time where most manpower was available for conscription. So it was also a dangerous moment for the establishment, uh, where, in which people were kind of habituated, in a sense, to take part to the um, to warfare. Um, we'll see it better in, in videos about the army organization and training, but this Egyptian Old and Middle Kingdom forces were uh, composed mostly numerically by the aforementioned levy system for which again uh, late adolescents would essentially stay for a couple of years around the towns where they were properly trained they were given a specific aircraft they were kind of trained um, with all the various weapons they would be um, properly engaging in wrestling in, in other activities that were meant properly to toughen them up to to make them become able and at that point they would be sent back and they would remain with that kind of basic training um, a valuable source uh, as you understand mostly in a quantitative sense for the royal army right other forces were instead kind of permanently stationed in in, in the towns others were probably you know professional ones um, and uh, and then there was a uh, you know, Pharaoh's uh, army that was, in especially in the royal retinue, composed mostly by properly the elite, and so people with um, enormous, um, enormous experience and regular aptitude to all the, you know, largest scale degree of massacres and you know, a large numbers of properly manslaughter and battlefield in, in any other condition that were very much the same Ra's iron fist manifesting on earth um, and we will hopefully talk about this at some other point however for today I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.